Good morning. It's good to be with you uh, here at LaGrave again on this uh, beautiful Lord's Day. We're going to be turning to Romans chapter 6. I'll be reading the first 11 verses of Romans 6. First, please pray with me. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak, O Lord, your word of gospel grace. Through Jesus, the word made flesh. Amen. Paul writes to the Romans, What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may increase? By no means. How can he who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, so we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus Give thanks to God for his holy word. In a scene from the 1980s movie, When Harry Met Sally, the title character of Harry Burns is sitting in the stands at a New York Giants football game with his friend Jess. And as the then popular wave rushes across the stadium, you know, with people standing up and putting their arms in the air to create that wave-like effect across the stands, Harry participates whenever it comes around, but he's actually visibly depressed. He then informs Jess that his wife had recently suggested that perhaps they could live apart. Perhaps they could see other people. But perhaps they could still see one another occasionally, kind of like when they were dating. Harry then says... I got married so I could stop dating, so I don't see how dating your wife is all that attractive. Reminds me of something author Philip Yancey wrote in one of his books. Yancey invites us to consider what would surely be an absurd scenario. Imagine a couple who fell in love and eventually got married. The wedding and reception were grand affairs, and the couple spent their wedding night in the honeymoon suite of a fine hotel. But then imagine the next morning at breakfast, the husband says, Honey, as we get going on our married life together, I wonder if we might negotiate a bit on how often I could see other people. Well, that is indeed absurd. You get married to be exclusive. Marriage means not seeing other people. No sane married person would suggest a scenario in which you could simultaneously live like a non-married person. The only possible response to a new husband making a suggestion like that would be to say, are you out of your mind? Are you nuts? Cue the Apostle Paul and his reaction when he got wind of the fact that some in the early church had taken his message of salvation by grace alone as a license to live however they wanted. Paul encountered an early version of a saying that's often been attributed to the writer Heinrich Heine, God likes to forgive. I like to sin. Really, the world is admirably arranged. And so also some in Rome had apparently concluded that since God loves to forgive by grace alone, let's give God ample opportunity to let that grace abound again and again to cover our ongoing sins. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we'll be forgiven again anyway. Now, in the Greek language, there are four main moods of verbs, three of which we have also in English. There's the indicative mood for simple declarations. The sun is shining brightly today. 
There's the imperative mood for the giving of commands. Sit down and eat your broccoli. There's the subjunctive mood to consider possibilities. If I were the president, I would. But then in Greek, there's also the optative mood to express, express future hopes and, and wishes. May you find great success in your new career. Or, more forcefully in the negative, cancer, may you never experience that. Now, in most Greek literature outside of the New Testament, the optative comes up a lot. But in the Greek of the Bible, it hardly ever comes up. But one of the relatively rare but important uses of the optative is right here in Romans 6, verse 2. When Paul invokes this verb mood to answer his opening question through the optative line in Greek, me genoito, should we sin more so that grace may abound? Me genoito, by no means. See, Paul needs the, the force of the optative here to convey something that could be paraphrased as absolutely and absolutely not. No way. Are you kidding? Are you nuts? The verb in the optative mood brings home Paul's incredulity. And the balance of our passage this morning explains how and why Paul found this idea to be absurd. It is, in fact, so absurd that Paul concludes that those who were saying this have missed a fundamental fact of Christian identity. They have missed what baptism really means. Sometimes it seems that we in the church today may have a similar struggle, but more on that in a little bit. But first, we should recall that when we read New Testament epistles or, or letters like Romans, we're basically reading somebody else's mail, right? This was not really written specifically to us. And at least some of Paul's letters in the New Testament are replies to an original letter to which we have no access at all anymore. I mean, by way of analogy, suppose one day after your grandma died, you run across a shoebox of old letters to, that your grandma had received from her sister, your aunt. Now, you don't have grandma's original letters to her sister. And so, when in one of her letters, your aunt mentions sharing grandma's concern about someone named Phil, well, you won't know right off the bat who Phil was or what was so concerning about him. If your aunt wrote, thank you for that recipe, it worked out great, you won't know if grandma had sent a recipe for pot roast or cherry pie. You'll have to do some work to figure it out. And Romans 6 is the same. Paul is responding to some misunderstanding of baptism, but precisely what that entailed, not 100% clear. But possibly it was something like this. Some in the Roman church concluded that baptism just cleaned up your soul for past sins. It's just a symbol that God likes to forgive. It's just an initiation rite that puts you in a place where God will continue to forgive your sins. Baptism is symbolic, and that's about it. No, Paul says that's incorrect. In baptism, you die. The waters of baptism don't just wash away sin from the soul the way physical water washes dirt off your hands. Now these waters are deeper than that. Deep enough, in fact, to drown in. And that's what happened to your sinful self in your baptism. It died. It got buried. End of story. Except not quite the end. Because if you died and got buried with Jesus, then come Easter you get raised with Jesus too. And not just raised, but raised changed. You get raised new, a new creation, as Paul will put it to the Corinthians. And just as getting married means by definition you don't get to see other people, so being buried with Christ into death and being raised with Christ to new life means you cannot want to perpetuate sinful activities. Your baptism was no mere symbol. Your baptism changed you. It altered your point of view, reset your appetites, realigned what you find loathsome and what you find attractive. It's impossible to want to keep sinning when you die to the idea that sin is just a great way to live. Sin's a great way to have fun. Sin's a great way to enjoy life. Now you now dwell in Christ, in His new life. 
Baptism ended the old you. And you can't want to undo that. Period. Any questions? But all of that forcefulness that we just saw is why verse 11 is rather striking. Because as Paul rounds out this part of this chapter, he changes verb mood one more time. In verse 2, we have the optative mood of by no means, no way. In verses 3 through 10, we got the indicative mood of simple declarative statements like, you died, you were buried with Christ in baptism. But then in verse 11, we get the imperative mood, a command. So then, figure that this is true. Think of yourselves this way. Reckon that this is a fact. Count yourselves dead to sin. Just figure that you are alive to God and go from there. Now, that's not exactly what you might have thought Paul would say at this juncture. Why would he have to order people to think a certain way if everything he said in verses 2 through 10 is true? Shouldn't this be automatic for people who are truly baptized into Christ's death and resurrection? Doesn't it water it down, forgive the pun, doesn't it water down what he just said by effectively conveying the idea, so, you know, figure that this is the case, Assume that you are alive to God. Think this way. What explains that? Well, what explains it is our spiritual reality. Despite the cosmic and seismic work of Christ, we still live between the times. We are already and not yet people. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, and yet we still live in the kingdoms of this world. We have been saved, we are being transformed, but we're not home yet. I'm not a big fan of t-shirt or bumper sticker slogans that reduce deeper theological truths to a pithy saying, but there is more than a little truth to the saying you sometimes see on a t-shirt, God is not finished with me yet. Everything Paul says in Romans 6 on the transformative power of baptism is true, And it's also true that for now, we have to will ourselves to reckon that that's true. We have to actively try to think this way and ask the Holy Spirit to help us live this out accordingly. Since we began with the marriage analogy, let's extend the analogy to a a wedding ring. Now, the ring uh, is, yes, a symbol of your marriage, but it's also a tangible reminder to you that this is who you are. When tempted to violate your marriage vow, use your thumb to touch that ring and remind yourself. And don't take off that ring when you're traveling or something, just, you know, in case you meet somebody attractive. No. Maybe I shouldn't use two movies in one sermon, but another fine movie from the 1980s is Moonstruck. Olympia Dukakis won an Oscar for her portrayal of Rose Castorini the long-suffering wife of a husband who had been seeing another woman in various ways for some time. Well, at one point in the film, Rose is dining alone at a local Italian restaurant when she meets a charming rogue who is a college professor and whose date for the evening had dramatically stormed out at one point. Rose feels bad for the man and so invites him to join her for dinner, and later he walks her home. And as they stand in front of Rose's walk-up brownstone home in Brooklyn, The man suggests that maybe they should go into the house together and, you know, see what happens. Rose refuses. Oh, you think someone else is home, the man says. No, I think the house is empty, replies Rose. I can't invite you in because I'm married, because I know who I am. Because I know who I am. Think that way about yourselves, Paul urges in verse 11. Know who you are. Know who you are and act like it. Remember that you have been baptized and then live like you know what that means. Well, today, I don't think we meet up with too many people who are so spiritually crass as to say in so many words, let's sin more so that grace may abound. But if the history of the church right up to this present moment is any indication, we continue to have the same basic struggle Paul identified in Rome 2,000 years ago. We too find any number of ways to forget who we are. Two years ago in the summer of 2022, 
I crisscrossed the country to convene, to convene listening groups of pastors from a wide variety of denominations. I visited San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Sioux Center, Iowa, Baltimore, Maryland, Denver, Colorado. I wanted to listen to how pastors describe today's preaching and worship and environment. What has a decade or more of fierce partisan divides in the U.S. done to the church? What did the pandemic do? Or better put, what did the pandemic reveal? And the answer in too many churches was a whole lot of sorrow and sad realities. It reminded me of a Kathleen Norris line from her spiritual memoir, Dakota. Norris noted at one point that when she began attending a small South Dakota church, she discovered a group of people who, to use her words, were behaving about as badly as grown-ups know how to behave. And so also disputes over COVID's reality, masking, social distancing, the suspension for a season of in-person worship, vaccines, it all tore communities apart and sent many a faithful pastor packing. And then the pastors told me there are all the other things a pastor can now say in a prayer or in a sermon that leads to swift trouble. Try to preach a sermon on justice from the book of Amos and you get labeled as woke and that's it. Suggest there is such a thing as systemic racism in this country, that, that white nationalism has invaded parts of the church and pastors sometimes discover unsettling facts in how people react. Oh, no. We don't ever say, let's sin more so that God's grace may abound, but in our willingness to behave about as badly as grown-ups know how to behave, in our resistance to seeing how the culture war mentality is, is shredding our larger union in Christ on any number of issues, well, we too sometimes live like our baptism never happened. And so to also the church today, Paul says, shall we let nationalism, white supremacy, the politicization of all life continue? Shall we allow ourselves to deride one another over issues that have nothing to do with our salvation or our union with Christ and with one another? Meganoito, by no means, no way, are you nuts? Remember who you are. Reckon with the fact that you are alive to God and dead to the ways of the world and then live like that's the case. Of course, this is a reminder we all need. We don't need to consider extremes in the church to see ourselves in this picture. We all face temptations to cut corners in our lives, to go along to get along, to essentially take off our baptismal wedding ring at work or on vacation or at school so as to hide from others and even hide from ourselves the reminder of who we really are in Christ. We all struggle to live our baptismal identity. And we none of us can do it at all without the grace of God's Spirit to stick with us, to prod us, to jog our spiritual memories. We need the grace of the Spirit to pick us up when we fall down, to dust us off and help us as we continue to limp along the way of following Christ. We don't need to decide to sin more so that grace can abound. Grace abounds to all of us even when we're trying our best. As the old bumper sticker says, lead me not into temptation. I can find it myself. In preaching class at Calvin Seminary, students often wrestle with the fact that Paul's letters contain so many imperatives. I mean, how can a person avoid preaching a message of works righteousness, you know, of the idea that we save ourselves by being good? How can we avoid that given that almost any 15-verse stretch of a Pauline epistle probably contains 10 command statements on what to do and what not to do. And so I remind students that for Paul, the indicative always precedes the imperative. You have been baptized, now act like it. Paul never says behave so that you can become worthy of being saved. No, Paul's commands always come down to one thing. Be who you are. Be the person your baptism created you to be. In closing, I will note that I often warn my students not to switch up a key image at the end of a sermon. I know we've used the marriage and the wedding ring as a symbol in this sermon, but I wish to close with another mess, uh, image because it's too good to pass up. Just don't tell my students. And Aaron? Hmm. Anyways, you know, one of the finest preachers in our CRC neck of the woods was a man named John Timmer. Uh, 
In a memorable sermon, Timmer noted that a long while ago, men in Ireland who made their living off uh, the fishing trade, each of them wore a heavy wool sweater, each with a distinct pattern. No two fishermen's sweaters were alike, and everybody knew which sweater went with which man. Why was that important? Because sometimes men were swept into the sea and drowned. And in the cold, brackish waters of the North Atlantic, it didn't take long for a body to decompose beyond recognition. So when one of these hapless souls washed ashore, people would know who it was based on the sodden sweater on the corpse. In other words, Timmer said, each man carried constantly with him a a reminder of death. And so also, Timmer said, we baptized people need to wear our baptismal identity in Christ every day. We died. We drowned. But unlike a dead Irish fisherman, we were also revived. And so now we need to, as Paul says in Colossians 3, we put on Christ almost like it was a wool sweater as a reminder of who we are every day. Just figure that you are alive to God in Christ. Count on it. Think that way by the grace of the Holy Spirit. People of God, be who you are. Be who you are. And be thankful. Amen. Lord our God, for your gospel, for the saving waters of baptism, we give you our profound thanks. Remind us prod us, live in us by your Spirit that we can display you to one another in this church and to the watching world. Through Christ, amen.